I need an interior <laughs> designer for this stuff, man. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to another session of Hashtag Grow Her Game Filipinas Football Forum at Home Series. We are on session 12 and today we have with us some special guests to talk about a women's team on building the women's club culture. Very interesting topic. Um, Tosh, uh, can you introduce our guest for today? All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, first up, we have Paul Tolentino. So Paul has played with the youth national team for U16, U19, and U23. He played with Kaya FC back in 1998. When he came back to the Philippines in 2013, he went on to be the general manager of Kaya FC. And under him, for Kai FC, they've had a couple of achievements. The UFL Cup in 2015, the Copa Paulino Alcantara Cup in 2018, and as well as AFC Cup appearances in 2016, 2019, and this year, 2020. So welcome to the show, Paul. Thank you very much for having us and inviting me. And next up, of course, we also have Jing Ham Lang. He played football at a young age as well for CSA Makati back in 2005. He started writing uh, football articles back in 2010 for Inside Football, which is a UK-based website. He joined the UFL later on that same year as the assistant technical director and writer. And he then eventually transitioned into the media head for UFL in 2013 and 2014. He's also a well-known sports commentator for volleyball, other sports, but most especially for football since 2011 up until present. He's also in charge of Kaya FC's media and marketing from 2017 up until present, and as well as a co-host for Across the Line podcast with Chris Greatwich, where, you know, they talk about all things football. So welcome to the show, Jing. Oh, man. Absolute pleasure, Tosh and Bella. Thank you for having us here. On <laughs> Benai football and grow her game. Um, man, yeah, it's been a long road in Philippine football, huh? It's yeah, nice to be here. Definitely. Bumpy road, but we're getting there. And last but not the least, we have Pat Tomanon. She played Div 1 football for Florida International University. She's currently with the women's national football team, 22 caps and one goal to her name. So this defender started up with the national team back in 2016 after being scouted in the U.S. back in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And she's, you know, helped with this second part of the, the women's national team throughout their growth, most especially with appearances in the AFF, AFC, the SEA Games 2017, as well as the Olympic qualifiers where she helped, you know, get those results. Of course, she's also a member of the Kaya women's football team who have played in the Sevens League. They had the finals appearance. And as well as she's a Kaya Academy coach for the U U13 and the U17 girls. And she has her PFF Diploma C license. So welcome to the show, Pat. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Wow, I didn't expect that intro to be that long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a lot to brag about as you're talking about. <laughs> and of course, um, let's just dive deep right straight into the football of things. Um, Paul, let's start with you. Uh, take us through Kaya FC. Where did it start from? How did you end up becoming the general manager? So back in 2012, I was working in San Francisco in the Bay Area doing things very different after college. So I had been working about five years in search engine and uh, online marketing. And uh, Santi came over to San Francisco to talk with me about Kaya and um actually asked me to come back to be a coach <laughs> and I said uh no I'm not qualified to be a coach but I'd love to help out and run the club in that type of management um type of scale and and then he took my bluff and said yes so then I had to quickly decide and figure out was I ready to pack up and leave the U.S. and my job to come back to the Philippines and work for Kaya and made the decision to do it obviously, um, because football is my passion and what I love to do. And actually, when I spoke with my former boss at the time about it, I was really nervous to bring it up that I might be leaving him and the company and the whole thing. And he just looked at me like, are you an idiot? Go. <laughs> so um, 
so then that happened. So 2013, I moved back permanently, obviously still green, learning a lot of things on the fly and adapting to both not just Kaya, but the Philippine football landscape as a whole, the club football scene, the different general managers, the different clubs, the different uh, coaches, people in media, all these things. Uh, but it's been a fun journey. Definitely. And um, as you're talking about Kaya FC, you know, that's one of the longest standing clubs that there has been in the Philippines. You know, you guys started out, let's say, in 1992, you know, one of the very first clubs as well in the Philippines. What made you guys decide to take that next step? to handle and to take on a women's football club? Um, to be honest, like the women's um, part of it in terms of making it, you know, semi-pro, I guess you want to call it, or really focusing on the senior women's side came about um, last year. I was watching the Women's World Cup and it was the second night, second or third night of matches. It was... Italy versus Australia and I was just blown away at the quality of the football and the support that they were getting and then at halftime they had a panel and there is um, there's one player present player for sure maybe two I can't remember exactly but um, and they were talking about how like you know everyone is just looking for that opportunity like, you know, we all just want more clubs. We want to be able to play and compete more and the whole thing. And then it dawned on me that like, why haven't we as Kaya done this? Like the club stands for inclusion of all social, religious, any demographic, any nationality, any background, yet our women's portion is lacking and it's a big hole and it doesn't seem right. And so yeah, started um, ruminating about it. And then, you know, maybe a few days later, actually looped Jing into the conversation. It was a meeting with Jing, Ali, and myself. And I was like, you know, I have a couple of ideas and here's one of them. And they were very positive about the idea. And they're like, yeah, why haven't we done this? Um, and that we should probably go ahead and start women's football with Kaya. And of course, as you're talking about that, um, Jing, I just want to ask you that question there. As someone who's worked, especially in that media side for football as a whole and covering such as UAP, you know, for UAP, they only cover the women's finals and you've covered a lot of that. So when Paul came to you, you know, with Kaya FC taking on that next step, how did you feel about it? He came in and said that he had a crazy idea. And then when he said it, it's like, it's not a crazy idea. It's like, it's like, we've all been crazy for not thinking about it. You know what I mean? Like it's already there. And when you see something like the UAP final, as you mentioned, I mean, we called those games together and we both know how exciting those games were and uh, how, um, you know, you, you, you really feel captured by the, the matches that, that, were, that transpired. You know, there's a lot of drama. The quality was great. And you, you start thinking to yourself, like, why don't we see more of these matches uh, live on TV, right? And... Obviously, if the quality is already there and there's an entertainment value to it, then there is definitely some value there that's being left on the table, right? It's not being maximized. So when I heard about it, that it was going to happen, my mind immediately switched into like, yeah, what, what could we do if we started putting it out there that there is a women's team? And it didn't take long for me to get my answer as to how it would impact our community because I put out the tryout poster and, and already there was a, a legion of attention that already uh, was brought to the page. Once we started talking about the tryouts and putting out videos and, and photos about the tryouts, um, man, there was a lot of excitement about it. And just to put something into perspective, quite recently, we put out a post um, with Tin Cleofe um, on, uh, on Facebook. It got 1,200 shares. Obviously it wasn't about you know, women's football specifically. It was about the return to training for uh, football clubs, but utilizing a picture of a, of a women's player and people resonated with it. You know, it's like they, it's, it's clearly something that people are, are thirsting for as well. Mm -hmm. And when I look at, um, you know, the women's team and how well they're doing and how well the social media game of the women's team is, and you see people's attention uh, really be captured, uh, you see that, you know, there's, there's a market for it, 100% for, for women's football. 
And of course, speaking of that market for it, Pat, you were a player that was based in the U.S., you're a national team player, and now you're also playing for Kaya, the Kaya women's team, and as well as coaching for them. So take us through your transition from working, from being based in the U.S. and taking that leap to come to the Philippines. Well, so I just found myself, right, so we would have campaigns maybe once or twice throughout the year. I would spend two months at a time. So it was a lot of traveling. So trying to work in the States and finding like a semi-stable job that would allow me to come and be gone for two months was like, I mean, I was fortunate for a year that I had a boss that was like, yeah, yeah, go, go pursue whatever it is that you want to. But it just got to the point where I was like, I think the motherland is calling me and I have to go back, right? And um, it was also a time where it's just trying to find how I can help the women's game in a way. And I, I didn't think it would be coaching for me. I thought it would be in terms of playing. So I mean, being able to do both is amazing. So being able to play for a club that has a youth program and um, being able to work with people that want to grow the women's program as well has just been incredible. So yeah, I'm here for the long haul, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> She's there for the long haul. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Of course, um, Paul, I just want to ask as well regarding, let's start first pre-COVID. Um, how did you go about, you want to go into the details of how you ended up choosing Coach Let, who is the national team coach to be, to, how did you get her on board? Because a lot of people have been courting her, you know, to be able to take on a women's team that's outside of UAP. So how did that go? How were you able to, you know, get her on board for Kaya FC? So I don't want to run on too long, but I think it's fair to give more background because I had, you know, jumping into this project or um, endeavor of growing the brand of Kaya and enriching the club was understanding that my knowledge on women's football wasn't as vast as it was on the men's side. So I had a couple people in the Kaya staff that were much more knowledgeable. So Eunice is one of our PTs and, you know, she's also working with the national team. And then Coach Noel, our, our former head coach, um, is very familiar with uh, both the women's side because he had helped coach on the women's teams and also very familiar with qualified coaches because he worked very closely with um, the PFF. So I sat down with them and I was asking, you know, if we, well, I presented to them the idea like I did with Jing and Ali and then basically asked them, I want to pursue this. Who are the people we should look at to run this program because obviously I'm not going to be the one qualified to run the program, not just from a coaching point of view, but even from um, planning and management, I still had a lot to learn. So a couple of names came up and hers was one of the ones at the very top. And when they mentioned her name a couple of times too, as one of the main ones to consider, my first question back to them was, isn't she really busy? Like, will she even be interested in taking this on? And Coach Noel just basically said, hey, you know, I'll, I'll message her and then let's see what she says. And not even three hours after the meeting, Coach Noel had messaged me back and said, Coach Let already replied and she said she's interested and she wants to meet with you. So I was shocked, but very excited. And... It's unfortunate she's busy today, so she couldn't explain exactly her reasons for it. But if I'm to summarize it, um, she just felt that amongst, I guess, the different projects that were presented to her. And I had found out later on that actually Kaya Academy had approached her as well, and she had turned them down when we were meeting. But she was saying it's something she's been looking for in terms of a club that could compete, but wasn't a university. Um, so she obviously pointed towards the women's league, right? And playing and competing there. Um, and she was just, I guess, sold on whatever Coach Noel had sold her on about Kaya and the club and what we stand for and what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, in sitting down with her, she was very excited, which then made me very excited. Yes. So just um, in line with that, when you were sort of 
courting her? Was that the term you used? Courting her? Um, I don't know. Was there any talks of like, <laughs> was there any talks of like, we have a Kaya philosophy and this is what you are imposing on the women's team or does the women's team have their own philosophy? How did that work out? Um, definitely, Kaya has its philosophy, its vision and what it stands for. And, you know, as much as possible, even since when I was exposed to it at a young age, at about 16, playing and training with them and then coming on board in 2013, I wanted to stay true to that because I fully value what clubs stand for. And, you know, I'm not going to work in a football club if I don't believe in what it stands for and, you know, what the owners are looking for and what they want to accomplish. So I made that very clear to her that this is what Kai is about. Um, you know, the usual, I'm sure a lot of people have heard the different spiel on what Kaya stands for and, you know, the brotherhood and all these things about um, a never say die attitude. But I also understood that the women's game probably has aspects to it that are maybe a little bit different, but I didn't feel that that should change how the club approaches it in terms of the big picture vision. Okay. Um, go ahead, so yeah, so um, what you're saying is sort of you did, there was a Kaya philosophy that had to be embraced or adopted, mm -hmm. but like, and just kind of put your touch to it. But also I picked up on something you said, that you said that the Kaya Academy actually invited you to be a coach. So is that not one whole big Kaya um, family? How come it, it is. was like... It is. Um... But the thing is, is she was coaching for a different academy at the time. Uh, so, that's right. Yeah. And so she had commitments there that she stayed true to. And again, in her explanation as to why she wasn't able to do it, because she already made the commitment and she wanted to stick with that commitment for me, again, prove that we're looking at the right person here because this person would stay if they committed and they gave their word on wanting to work on the project, then you know, they would stay loyal to it and see it out till the end, which is something that I value. And of course, Paul, since you were able to get the coach on board, Jing, I just want to ask you, you're talking about the tryouts earlier and, you know, you saw the number of girls that tried out, that there was a demand for it, that people were really looking for a venue to be able to play. Now that you had your coach and you were able to get your players, take us through that uh, creation of how that women's program later on played out. Yeah, you know, like it, it was um, it was an interesting challenge for me about how we were going to sort of project um, the women's team. But then eventually it, you know, it, it was a sort of a process of like figuring out that we shouldn't overcomplicate what we already have. Like Kaya has its own identity and the important thing is to be able to represent that identity across the different um, teams that we have, right? We've got the women's team, the men's team, and the academy. And essentially, um, we are all under one umbrella, right? It's about being able to showcase them under that umbrella. And um, I think it, it's panned out perfectly, you know? They, they, we have a, a profile of individual that fits into the club. As you, you heard Paul talk about, it's about your character first. Um, that, that is very important, right? It's about if you espouse the, the correct values, then we are particularly interested in you and your capabilities and not the other way around, right? So um, I think with the profile of players that we found that were quite interested in the club, um, uh, we were lucky enough that a lot of these players already had sort of a profile, right? As they played for the national team, individuals were already quite familiar with these, with these players. And with them and their hunger to be able to have sustained practices, for them to be able to be in competition uh, on a regular basis uh, and outside of training camps, then the, the story kind of formulates itself, right? These are, this is the, the, the chance for them to showcase their talent on a regular basis and for them to stick together and always be training and improving themselves. And on top of that, it just so happens that the national team coach is also your coach in this club. So then we're helping build the chemistry of the team that we hopefully will see on the biggest stage not too long from now, right? So um, all of these things make it quite easy to, to, to project or sell this idea of a women's team because 
there's very few negatives, as I've, I've just said, right? All of those things are positives, um, it, not just for the club, but for Philippine football uh, as a whole you know, on the women's side. So I think it was just a matter of trying to get stories outside of the individuals of the women's national team. So if we go back to the beginning, I wanted to also highlight the individuals who were not attached to the national team yet, but were perhaps holding hopes of breaking into the national team, right? You have an individual like Nick Adlawan, let's say, who showcased her passion for the sport by coming back from Cebu. She was already supposed to take a job in Cebu and stay back in her hometown, but she found out about the tryouts and flew back specifically for that purpose to keep her dreams alive of playing football. That's an amazing story. It showcases the level of commitment these ladies have to a game that is not going to pay them to the same amount that the men's game will, but they want to play, right? So that's, to me, that to me, it says it all, right? These are women who want to play the game. And why don't we have a venue for that, right? So it, it, it means that if the passion is there and the, the quality is there, then we got to provide a platform for them to thrive. And hopefully that's what Kaya is, is doing or is one step towards a bigger playing field where more women can you know showcase their talent and 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 really enjoy their passion of playing football definitely you know one of the things that i really picked up there was the one of that the players that you got most especially the fact that you were able to have the women's national team coach on board and eventually the national team players as well of course they wanted to play for it just made it more that appealing to them to be able to play for that club and the fact that it, it, was a, it was beneficial for both parties in terms of the women's national team as a whole and as well for Kaya FC. You have elite players playing for your women's team, but at the same time, that other effect is that instead of these girls only being able to play together during camps for national team, they're able to play together consistently throughout the year so that when they do have camps for the national team, you don't have to worry about the bond that they're going to have to go through to make sure that the chemistry is there. The chemistry will already be there because a lot of the players are already playing together all year round, all together for a club. And, you know, that's a, I think that's a, one of the very great points that Kai FC did. You know, it was a win-win situation. As you said, there's very few negatives to it. Um, Pat, I want to ask you about how about Sorry. you experience as well being a player for the national team and playing for Kaya FC what was it like especially when you started out playing for Kaya FC what were the expectations and you know how did Kaya FC start out well I think um, they hold us to the same standard as the men's team so there's a lot of professionalism expected from players which you know again as a national team player that's something that I've gotten used to, but some of the other players may not have gotten used to that. So I think it's really good to expose all our UAAP, like very talented ex-UAAP or current UAAP players to that kind of um, environment because they, I mean, really it's not common. So it was really great. And having, of course, Coach Let being the coach, high standard of training, high expectations and yeah, so it's been really, really great to have that sense of professionalism even outside of national team. I think, sorry, if I can jump in, Tasha, too. Like, one of the conversations I had with Coach Let as well was, well, first of all, when the tryout happened, like, I know, I know Coach Let, the player and the legend that she is, because mm -hmm. she was my cousin's teammate back, um, you know, when I was ending my playing career, um, and had continued reading about her. I didn't know her as the coach, right? Like, what is her as the coach? And also Kaya being the new project, like there are other women's clubs, not just university clubs, you know, um, Iraya was there, Archers was there, Outcast was there, Nomad. I mean, there are different clubs that have already been in the scene, right? And so when the tryout was called, to this day, I still tell the girls, it's like, thank you. Because I was mm -hmm. genuinely surprised at the, quality of the players that showed up because you and Bella have managed teams before as well um, and when you call open tryouts it's it's a you know it's a mixed barrel of what you're gonna get right and sometimes it's not really what you're looking for 
but this time around it was like I, I was looking at Jing, I was looking at Ali, I was looking at uh, Alfred, all, basically people that were there trying to help out and just like blown away like seriously like all these girls are interested like they want to play and the quality was was really impressive so right after the tryout um, we sat down again and had a discussion and it was a discussion I had with coach Let before too because I knew she was the coach of the women's national team and I didn't feel particularly comfortable um, and neither did she to be fair to really advertise it um, or recruit people actively right uh, because that's not really what we wanted to do and one of the main conversations we had was we need to have a balance like it can't be 15 national team players yes. because they have their own stuff when national team gets called. We also have to build a culture within players that aren't national team players and also players that maybe might be younger, you know, um, 16, 17, 18, 19, you know, along those ages and help develop to, for them to maybe get to that stage if that's what they want. But there needs to be a balance across the board. Um, and that was one of the important talking points when we were building the roster, as you say. Um, yeah, for Kaya. So it's so interesting that you talk about balancing the roster because what I actually wanted to point out earlier when Tasha was speaking was, um, do you think like this might create an imbalance in the league? Like, would it be a situation where all the top players also like I'm just throwing it out there? Like, it might be a sort of situation that mirrors starts a little bit the PFL that one team will have all for whatever reason it is. Uh, we'll have all the stronger players and then um, we'll have results that are like I, I think like 10 zero I think it's a it's a fair comment um, and it's one that we have to continue to guard ourselves against um, to really stay true to what we planned at the beginning and really you know as basic as keeping count how many are within the pool how many are within the extended pool that maybe don't always get called up. Sometimes we'll get called up and then those that aren't, right? And making sure that that balance exists. We're not, we're not getting into women's football to just dominate and, you know, all of this stuff. Like, first of all, it's kind of arrogant to come in and think you can do that. Um, you know, the university teams are very strong. They train on a daily basis. Their players are super fit. Um, and their chemistry is much stronger than what we're able to build in six months that we are now almost a year, short of a year that we've been doing this. But regardless, um, do we want to be competitive? Absolutely. <laughs> and, but it also, I guess in a way is what we're trying to do. I don't think, um, you know, we're, we're obviously lucky that we have a sponsor and a backer that we do in the LBC, but I don't think our model is that difficult to replicate, to be honest. Um, it's, it's really, if people really wanted to sit down and talk about it, it's, it's not that different. Um, I think it's just more on how other people might be approaching it if they believe in our model or not. So, but what was the vision on day one? Like, yeah, I get it. You want to help the sport. You want, you want to be competitive, like strike a balance, but what was the vision on day one that when you started this or wanted to start it, where did you see it going? Um, Jin can correct me if I'm wrong here. I think it was more on, we'll compete anywhere we have a venue to compete in. And we'll compete with whatever group of players believe in Kaya's vision um, and what we're about that want to compete in. Because even before we committed to the lineup, we again had the meeting. We had three tryouts. After the third one, we called a meeting with the girls that we had selected. We had sent out emails to everyone we had selected and basically invited them if they were interested. And every single one of them showed up. And in that same time, before the training started, it was explaining what Kaya is about. Um, and they all seem very excited and believed in the vision and what Kaya stands for, because as I said, you know, what it used to stand for in terms of Susi Nankapatiran, you know, Jing and I were then discussing, well, we can't call it a key to brotherhood anymore because now we got sisters as well. So, you know, it's like, 
it's like a big well-rounded family now um, where it's not just a brotherhood, it's a sisterhood. It, it's just a big family that we got to cultivate and continue to grow. To go back to your question and not drag on, it, it, to be honest, I didn't know what to expect. So it was, like I said, compete where we can compete, do the best that we can, um, keep the culture of the club alive and see where it takes us. Okay. Thank I think you. I just want to ask as well, because um, you could see the impact that Kaya has made when they started that women's team. You know, it was really big buzz, most especially in women's football scene for Pinay football and all that. So take us through um, the media as well. So you're handling the media for Kaya FC. Take us through the reaction as well of people towards the posts that Kaya FC group would make, including very much including a lot of posts about your women's players. How did the people react to that? I think it has just been generally positive, very positive, in fact. Um, the rumblings, there were a few rumblings here and there regarding uh, what Bella brought up or regarding like uh, stacking the, the roster with too many quality players or, or getting players from the national team. Th that was very minimal in terms of what people were saying. And as, as Paul mentioned, and that, that wasn't the intention of the club, right? So it was all about just staying true to what we wanted to do which was we wanted to create another segment to the club to make it more well-rounded in that we had the women's, the men's, and the academy. That completes that triumvirate that you need to be a well-rounded club, right? So when we started putting it out there uh, and, and sharing with everyone sort of the activities and the achievements that the, the, the team uh, has been, uh, been able to, to do, the, the response is, I would say, equivalent to that to the men's, which is, was surprising to me, you know, because the, the, the following was created on social media with the men's team specifically in mind, right? I mean, it was created around them. It wasn't around the women's team, but they've been embraced as being part of the Kaya family instantly. It, it, it's almost as if, okay, great, more things to be excited about, okay? Not only are we looking forward to uh, the game against, uh, stallion in the pfl but we're also playing against stallion in the sevens football league um and that's a big game right so now there's two reasons to be excited about on saturday one is at three o'clock in the in the afternoon the other one is later on this evening at six to seven p.m right so um yeah i think it's it, it's not saturated enough the football you know what i mean there's reasons for people to just they, they want something to be excited about and if we have a women's game we have a men's game we have an academy game to look forward to that's all the better you know of course you were talking about that um pat i want to just ask you as well you know as you were saying you know embracing the the kaya culture and being part of that academy as well so you're a player for the kaya women's team but you're also a coach for the youth team um, take us through your responsibilities as a player, how you're able to fit two roles, which is being a player and as well as a coach for the youth team. And is it that for just for the women's team, the youth women's team? Uh, no, I've actually been able to help with some of the, the co-ed teams, some of the boys teams as well. So pretty much all around, but I had like my girls group, which is exciting for me. Um, yeah, so it's it's actually been quite easy in a way that since I'm still playing so I'm learning different aspects of the game as I'm coaching um, and being able to teach that to the girls and boys that I work with and there have even been a couple of times where we had sevens games and some of the some of my girls showed up to the games and uh, it just really melts my heart having that kind of impact on them and kind of giving them something to look forward to to continue their career in football if that's something that they want to pursue and hopefully by the time they're my age there's something more competitive for them to join so it's been basically it's, it's been a dream I'm not gonna lie coaching and playing just being immersed in the football community has been great so far no negatives for me 
That's definitely good to know. And um, Paul, as you're talking about that, how many women do you have on your the, the coaching staff? So from the girls playing, how many girls are also coaching for the Kaya Youth Academy? I care to jump in. I believe, I believe <laughs> um, Pat and, uh, and Ina are in there. Is there, am I missing someone? Um, well, 10 was going to yes, join right. us as well, but unfortunately with the um, pandemic yeah, going on, she right. was unable to fulfill it. But yeah, so hopefully once we're back on, there'll be the three of us in the academy. You know, but what amazed me also with the whole organization is um, that they are, you know, kind of giving another opportunity for more women to play the game. But also when I saw them at the C Lice or C Diploma course, and it's like, when you talk to them, they were supported by Kaya and there's like uh, Pat there, Tin, and a few of the other coaches. It's like, um, it's a holistic approach. And as Tasha and I were talking, I, I said, you know, this is a very interesting um, uh, discussion because I know that Paul would not jump into something half-heartedly. So I know that it's something we can really learn from how he is helping to further the women's game. Well, pang ending topic ng sinasabi ko, but <laughs> just, you know, it's a compliment to you guys like that he, there's a lot of trust and um, belief in the organization. Definitely. You know, um, I'd like to add to that because we've had a lot of the players of Kaya on this um, forum as well. And, you know, when we talk to Ina, when we talk to Cam, you know, a lot of them just keep talking about the positives of Kaya FC, most especially how supportive Kaya has been even throughout this pandemic. Um, I guess I'm not sure who I'm going to throw this to, Paul or Jing or Pat, but you know, just take us through some of the initiatives that Kaya has done to make sure that your players, not just in the men's, but in the women's team, you know, they still feel important. They're making sure that they're still fit. So take us through um, the initiatives that Kaya has done to make sure that everyone is still on that same um, mindset regarding football it's that Who's bad lead this? off <laughs> um, i feel like i've been talking too much and i want um, an unbiased good, view good. i want the player's view without you know i can mute my or take the audio off so pat can be honest but um no it's been i don't even really remember my days have just blended in but yeah we started the zoom sessions with our physios that um jolo has Put up a program and we have our other physios um, joining in as well. We do our workouts five times a week, I believe. And then we have our, like we have like a team activity on one of those days. So it might be yoga. It might be like a fun, like um, recently we did like a quiz game about um, Kaya's history. So it's just a lot of bonding and um, we're able to adjust our time so that everyone can join. Cause you know, some of, some of our players are still currently working. Um, so it was really just trying to find time where everyone can join and see each other and continue having that chemistry, even though we're not going to, we don't really know the time frame as to when we'll see each other again. Um, yeah, so it's been really great. Super fit. Coach Let's jumped in and given us her sessions as well, which I've heard has been very challenging <laughs> as Paul would know. I think he tried out a session. <laughs> yeah. So it's been really good. But how about in terms of the when you got, when um, the pandemic happened, um, Jay, mm -hmm. how did you guys decide to you know how did you move forward? So what was the talk for KFC? How did you guys sit down? What were your decisions moving forward to make sure that you guys are still where you are now, where you have players who are still very much motivated and still somewhat continue to keep that bond because even throughout this pandemic, they're able to see each other, they're able to practice together. I think this is more of a question for Paul, but I mean, <laughs> he's the guy who, who speaks to the players, you know, and essentially if, if, if Paul's not going to jump in and, and really explain his messaging to the people, uh, to the team, it's, it's basically, we got struck with this pandemic in the middle of a season, right? So everybody was motivated to want to play in the AFC Cup and we were supposed to start the league in March. So everybody, were, everybody was very motivated. And we were looking forward to the next Sevens Football League campaign that was going to start with the women's. And um, everybody was, was geared towards that. And everything got halted in its tracks. And essentially, the rest of what we were looking forward to was unclear, 
right? So what can we control? We can't control the result of when this thing is going to end and when whatever is going to transpire down the road. But what we can control is just our mindset, right? Our mindset is that we're going to stay uh, true to what we were trying to do before this happened, which was stay fit, stay prepared, keep a mental game strong and, and make sure that uh, we're ready when the time comes, right? And I think everybody has, has jumped on board with that. And uh, I think everybody varies in their degrees of how they struggle with this pandemic. You know, some are a little bit more restless than others, but having that, that, that routine and seeing those same faces and, and being able to joke around with these individuals, it does wonders to your morale, you know? I sit there sometimes in those sessions and just mute myself and take off my video and just to see the guys and laugh as they make fun of each other and stuff like that. It's nice to be around that, that environment, you know, you miss it. Um, so it, it's been great. You know, it's been a fantastic way, not only to just stay fit, but to, to keep that camaraderie. I think it's important, you know, and um, everybody I think needs it a little, a little bit. So um, that's been the pro approach for us. And I think it's, it's been working, you know, just control what you can control right and see what happens down the road yeah. i think they covered it both very fairly i think if i were to add anything it, it's just really more the first two weeks was tough um we had just come back from indonesia um the men's team and we had to shut down like literally two days after we arrived the first day was useless because we arrived at like 5 6 a.m completely exhausted played the game the night before um, so that next day was a write-off. The next day we get the news and it's lockdown. So it was, okay, we just got to adjust. So for those first two weeks, there wasn't the Zoom sessions. Um, I think the women's started mid-April and the men started the first week of April, not April 1 exactly, but a little bit after it. Um, and it really came down to guys for our own sanity, you want to say, or health, or just a little bit of socialization is, it's good to see everyone. Uh, because everyone's in their own little bubble, uh, whoever it is you're quarantined with. And, um, you know, it, it's a joke within the small group, but Pat's part of the group, like Patrice started that whole push up thing. And the whole message of it was for mental health awareness. And it was like, mm -hmm. all right, I mean, I got looped into it, I'll do it too, you know, so it's just little things to yeah. keep people connected i mean to say that everyone has the same levels of motivation i think that's not true but you know there's at least some level of you still see one another you're able to joke around you're able to still feel like a team and not feel so isolated um because football is a team sport and no one likes being by themselves um pandemic or no pandemic Okay, so going back to like the start again, I guess. So when you started forming the club, what are uh, the women's team? What were the non-negotiables in terms of like the roles, the coaches, the positions that you had that were specifically to the women's team? And then those people that you would kind of pull from the men's team that would kind of help out and take those roles. Sorry, I, I'm just trying to remember what, what it might have been, non-negotiables <laughs> or rules. Um, I, I think one thing, Pat, maybe, um, Pat, but you weren't there at the very start, huh? Uh, maybe Jing, I, was, I think Jing was there. Yeah. But I think one of the things, oh, okay, one is very clear to me now. One was because it wasn't entirely like a professional structure where everyone gets a salary yet, um, it was very much a, you got to show up to training. If you don't show up to training, you won't be selected for matches. Things as simple as that, you know. Um, and all rules apply to everybody, not just showing up, but showing up on time. Um, you know, these are basic rules that most clubs have. And, you know, those are things that we didn't want to change, basically. Yes, we understand um, girls are working, girls are going to school. But if we're informed ahead of time, then, you know, those are things that are accepted um, within reason. Um, okay, I think you heard ro rules. I said rules. Sorry. That's rules. My bad. Rules, rules. <laughs> like coaching staff, like the coach, assistant coach, manager. <laughs> like what, how, when you were building the team, like who did you have to have that were specific to the women's? And then who would you put, like, for example, I'm sure Jing. 
Sorry, it's sorry. Random. It's okay. That's what to do. I'm not like, sure yeah. that, but that. <laughs> um, roles. Coach Let is definitely integral. Um, coach JP at the time was the assistant coach. Um, for this year, he had to focus on Ateneo. I think he had a lot more responsibility on that side. So he asked for a bit of a break on the Kaya side of things. So those two were very key. Obviously, Coach Let would have some conflicts in schedule, especially when the national team would be traveling. Um, and then at one point, it got really tricky because Coach JP actually got looped into cover for Coach Timo to be the assistant coach of the women's team. So um, that was an interesting time. <laughs> so <laughs> coach Timo. Coach Timo. 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 Yeah, I, I think we got lucky on that one too. Like Coach Hoshi helped out a few times. And then um, Coach Jen, who's one of the players, but is also a coach, um, also jumped in. And um, yeah, it really became a team effort uh, in terms of how to make everything work. Um, because it was also one of the things discussed with Coach Let at the very beginning was respecting her schedule and not imposing on anything she had committed to prior to Kaya. Right? So everything national team related was, you got to go do that. We'll just find a solution and find a way to make it work on our end. Um, PTs were generally shared, but we added on an, addi an additional woman PT in Nessie. So she joined and she's specific to the women's team. She covers sometimes on the men's team. Um, the roles outside of the coaching staff are all shared. Jing, myself, Ali, um, the kit man. The kit man brought in another guy to help him out. Um, one of his friends so that was nice too um, but yeah I hope that answered your question better yeah so I got the <laughs> rules and so we're good, good. Sorry. We're covered. and how often before like of course a pandemic um, how often would your women's team train and did they have um, were they sharing the pitch with the men's team or did they have their own time slot both <laughs> we've shared we've shared the field a couple times um particularly the end of last season um during the cup for the uh for the men's and then the like the knockout stages of the women's and then the women's typically we try to get two sessions a week which hasn't been consistent because it's difficult um both schedule wise and field availability wise at least once a week they train and then they play the one time a week based on the women's league schedule. Sorry, the sevens women's schedule. And then, but we were really trying to target two. And then eventually, you know, if we were able to find more sponsors or whatnot, continue to increase that to three times a week, times a week if possible. Um, Pat, as well as not just being part of the Zoom sessions when it comes to being a player, you also hold your own sessions as well as a coach for the youth team. So take us through that other step as well, that other dynamic of Kaya throughout this, um, everything that we're going through at the moment. You know, you guys are not just making sure that there's a platform as a sense for the men's team and the women's team, but for the youth as well. So take us through what do you do as well now for the Kaya as a, a kayak coach um so we have our structured setup um a specific coach is assigned for a specific day throughout the week so my slot is usually wednesday um so i do technical training so i do a lot of bomb mashy all the fun little videos i post on instagram i just come up with some patterns and um give them to my group so i you have U7 through U11 on like the 4 p.m. time slot. And then the 5 p.m. is for the 13s and up. So yeah, generally, like I'll have my training with Kaya Women's in the morning. And then I do my session planning for the week for my, for the academy sessions and all the small individual sessions I have with the club as well. So I get, I get the best of both worlds. So it's been really fun. And um, Jing and Paul, I just want to ask you guys with regards to adding not just national team players, but having women staff, most especially, most especially taking care of youth players and your women's youth team. How has it been beneficial for the club? Adding women's team, uh, sorry, coaches? 
um, yeah. other staff. Um, well, I think it just, you know, the whole idea of, of, of adding the women's team was sort of to round out the community, right? Um, it really does feel like a family now, you know? Um, and it's something that needed to be shifted in my mind specifically as well, because I'm so used to just, you know, focusing on the men's team. And now we're, we're, we're seeing that um, I need to add a little bit of parity in the way I post, right? It's not just going to be about everything that's about the men's team now. And there's a lot going on with the women's team as well, right? And, and being able to integrate more women in the, the Kaya Academy, having a coach let on board, it adds a, a different dynamic to the, to, to the community, right? Um, I don't know. It's not just like an all boys club. You know what I mean? You, mm. you, you, it's, it's not just the way you talk, the things that you talk about, but also like it's a different touch to, 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 to Kaya as a whole. It's quite interesting. You know, it, it's a shift in dynamic a little bit. You know, the culture is still there. The belief systems are the same. But um, the women are adding their own flavor to, yeah. to the club, right? They have their own personalities and um, we're adjusting to that and learning about that, you know? Um, and it's not just individuals, as I say, that are part of the national team that are well known to everybody. Somebody like Nicole Namores, right? Who's not playing in the national team. That woman is, is incredible. She, she's a fantastic player, uh, great personality as well. And, you know, personally me, I'm getting to learn all of them, all of their personalities, all of their characters, because I wasn't familiar with them. And that's not, that's sort of, I guess, sort of the landscape that we're in, right? It's more difficult a little bit to be, uh, to, to have access to all the women's players, right? If they're not in the national team, it's hard to get to know them. In the men's team, in the men's world, you know, there's many clubs. And if you, if you follow the clubs and you know, um, you know, Fitch Arboleda, you know, uh, Nathan Alquiroz and, and Matthew Neres of, of Stallion, you know, the players, Celes and them of JPV, it's easy. But for them, it's like, once you graduate, you're out in the wind. Nobody knows who you are anymore, right? And now I'm, I'm learning and meeting these new, new players. I'm like, man, I can't believe I've never seen this person play. Like this person's lights out. You know what I mean? And that's why it's fun to come to the sevens and also, you know, be immersed in the Philippine football community and see everybody. And w the women's time slot is normally just women's games are going on, right? So you see the players also from football fanatics, from a stallion. And you see the, the players of nomads. And man, it's a lot of like, you start looking at players, you're like, man, who is that? Who's that over there? Like, I don't know anything about these people, but we should be. We should be learning, right? There's a lot of interesting people to, to, to get to know. Can I also just say, Jing, to add to that? And the, others, the other aspect of that is when you think women's football, you do not automatically think of Kaya. Like, Kaya is such a old boys club sort of team and now it's a like Kaya comes out with a band like hey guys we're Kaya and we're now playing in the women's game like it's a, quite a welcome for Kaya and it was a very necessary welcome I feel like in these times um not putting again anything against other teams Satosh <laughs> but it's so refreshing to see like um because what you see that's different is kind of like it's an entire organization. Like it's what uh, Jing was saying. It's like it rounded their community, and they just came out and said, and is we're saying like, okay, we're Kayo Women's. We're now in the women's game. Um, this is who we are, and it's so interesting because you come up when when you write list like who are the teams participating in the women's league. I'm just like okay, Nomads, Heraya Stalia, and like that, but never like automatically think Kaya, but now we're going to have to shift gears also in that sense. And um, on that note, I was going to ask Paul like, and Jing and Pat if joining the Women's League is also in your sights. Go ahead, player. <laughs> apparently, I've got a little, I mean, apparently I'm a little too confident, but the, yeah, like <laughs> that's great. It would be so great to be play, able to play against other teams other like university teams club teams I mean, the more competition the better right and um, to add on to what you were saying prior is that the one thing that really drew me to Kaya was that yeah they took the initiative to try to bring that sense of like club you know culture for women and and hoping that would inspire other clubs 
groups that are a part of the PFL to do the same, to follow suit. And so now you kind of create this more competitive atmosphere in the women's game as well. Maybe then in the future, you'll have like rivalries just like they have in the PFL. And that would be, you know, that'd be amazing. That'd be so much fun. Yeah, so hopefully Women's League, whenever that's going to be. <laughs> Back to Bella, right? No, <laughs> no I mean, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I think Bella knows this because I spoke with you and I was reaching out to you last year when I was building the team, like, hey, when's the schedule for the Women's League and, um, and so on and so forth. And it was something we discussed with Coach Lett when we first met as well. The timing was really tight. We could have forced it, but the decision was made that it wouldn't be fair to force it if it meant kind of players from other clubs that already committed to then move over, which then would create a problem with those clubs. Like that wasn't the reason why we wanted to enter the women's game. We didn't want to enter to create a major disruption and destroy bonds or whatever it is. Not that we're saying everyone wanted to move. It's not everyone, but you know, even one or two players here or there that would leave from one club would change the makeup of what that club's plans were for the women's league. And we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to come in and create havoc. We wanted to come in to the women's game to join the clubs that are already there to kind of bring football together, which is what Kaya stands up for. And, you know, uniting everyone to play this beautiful game we all love. Definitely. And I'm pretty sure that everyone will be excited to have Kaya on board as well for the next Women's League. Bella, just let us know when that will be. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say like about the Women's League, where we, we keep um, um, pointing to Bella. It's not that too. It's like, we would love to help in any way and capacity that we could because one of the things I would always mention to the coaching staff and the managers was like, I don't think it's even fair that like, why does a women's league have to play matches at 8 a.m. in pretty far south? You know, like it's not, it doesn't feel right. You know what I mean? It's like, why can't they play same time slots or at least be in a, a time slot that is, more accessible for people to view it, to come watch, uh, little things like that, you know? So it's um, something that we really want to help with. And, you know, it's, it's great for you to be able to put those questions out there, especially coming from, a, you know, like someone who's handling the men's team and, you know, you're seeing how it is in the women's game because mm -hmm. not a lot of people know about what happens in the women's game, except for the women playing there. But to have a club, clubs like Kaya FC coming in and then they're seeing the dynamic of how the women's league is or how the women's game is. And of course, not only just trying to you know, play the games there, but also wanting to change it, wanting to help out, make it bigger. We all know that the women's national team and all that, like they're, they're really in a good spot right now. You know, they're on this rise. And to see clubs, let's say that Kaya FC, to follow suit, you know, seeing that trend of the women's game and wanting to be a part of it as well, to immerse it in the culture that is Kaya FC. So, uh, Jing, I just want to ask you as well, how has the women's team added, how has it added value to the club? I think, you know, it, it opens us up to a whole different demographic, right? I mean, there was a lot of women who are already following the the team anyway right it's about a 50 50 but it's 52 in favor of women who follow the club right um i imagine that it's gonna open us up to both men and women who are how should you say in the communities that um these women are already involved in right it opens us up to individuals who follow all the collegiate teams for example right uh, these women step out of that women's game and enter what exactly now there is something for them to enter into. And when they step onto our stage, then people are gonna be like, oh, there's a women's game. I didn't know, right? Uh, I wasn't awake at eight o'clock on Saturday to, 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 to know that there was a game, right, for example. So now there's individuals like, um, you know, it, it's, it's lucky or fortunate that, that Kaya has a platform of, of several thousand that they can push it out to. And it's not just here in Manila, by the way, right? We've managed to develop a bit of an Iloilo following as well. 
right? And now you have individuals from the provinces that are thinking, hey, man, I didn't know there was a women's game after I graduated, right? So I went home and did my own thing. But now there are opportunities for the next generation or even those who are already in the province to think, man, why don't I make an excuse to, to, to go to Metro Manila, right? Find a job there or something. And then maybe I could sneak my way into the, the women's game because there's something to do there, right? And, you know, some of the stories that we've heard of, of, of some of the players that, that have joined our team is that, you know, regular practices are, are not a common thing, right? It's not, it's not commonplace in the women's game, uh, not for everyone anyway, right? So to have just regular practices has already been an improvement. So if that becomes commonplace and people know that Kaya is doing this and Kaya joins the National, uh, the, the, the national League and, and starts performing to a decent level or a good level or uh, as Pat hopes will be title winning form, right? Then uh, hopefully that, that also will have a cascading effect with regards to other team knowing that, hey man, if we want to compete or we want to dominate the women's game, then we have to step up our game as well, right? If that continues as a trend for everybody else to follow, not that that was our intention to begin with or Paul's intention to begin with, but if it has that effect, then that's, that's great. That's, that's ex an extreme positive for the women's game of football, right? Uh, and we hope that, that that is something that, that, that moves the ball forward is, is creating this environment. And hopefully that will transpire and hopefully that will also translate and not only to the quality on the pitch and the organization, uh, organ organizational structure of the clubs, but what about the, the media? What about the broadcasting of these matches? What about how we portray it in the buildup to the matches, in the breakdown of the matches and building player profiles for individuals, not just on the pitch, but individuals like yourself, like Natasha and, and Bella. You know, you guys are involved in the game on camera, in backroom staff, playing on the pitch, it's everything, right? But not everybody is exposed to the level of commitment and responsibility that you guys have to the game, right? And people would be interested in that. I know that for sure. Um, so there's a lot of these stories that are out there that nobody gets to appreciate because it's not put out. But if there is a platform, then there is an excuse to put it out there. And hopefully that'll be the case because I've been thinking a lot about the women's game and sort of, you know, a lot of things have transpired in the men's game recently. And you, you sort of see over the last 10 years, the pros and cons of the journey that we've been on. And the women's game has not had an opportunity to be cast in the limelight yet, but you already have the base of knowledge of all the 10 years that the men's game has had. So you don't have to make the same mistakes and you can only pick up from, you know, all the positives that have transpired and hopefully be able to apply it and, you know, accelerate the progress of the women's league. And um, hopefully we'll see that after everything kind of settles down and returns to normal. Asha touched on a really good word there, value. I think on the business side of running Kaya, obviously Tasha would know this, Bella knows this as well. Football in the Philippines is not what it is in most other countries, which is revenue generating, but value being added is massive. When we started the women's team, it, it's just refreshed everything at the club and for a new fan base and just even the engagement when the women's posts are made or the girls are posting about it it just reinvigorates the entire club and everyone at the club in terms of you know why we're doing this what we're doing it for and that it's new um, obviously it wasn't new but it was new for us and you know it needed that it needed that badly i think philippine football needs that badly because let's be honest, like the men's game has hit so many bumps in the road recently where, you know, maybe the interest isn't as high and even sponsors wide and all of that. But the women's game is fresh. It's new. It's less expensive to enter. There's less barriers to enter. Um, and in Kaya specifically, it also kind of has us rethink and rework how we're going to do things on the men's side. Where can we be more efficient? Where can we cut costs? Um, especially with this pandemic affecting all businesses and everything is everyone is going through that now, restructuring and replanning and um, how to do it properly. And you know, the women's is a is a nice place to start because you're starting from almost at the very beginning. So you can really shape it the way it should be so it's sustainable long term. 
Definitely. You know, I think that's such a good point that both of you have put out there, of course, as well as the learning from how and what has happened to the men's football league and, you know, learning what we can from that and not and trying not to commit the same mistakes moving forward, you know, take as much positive as we can moving forward. And I think that what Paul and Jing have talked about when you're talking about, you know, how the players are given all of a sudden that opportunity, they have that limelight. And I think an example of that right there, right here on this um, forum is having Pat as well, who used to be a US-based player. So how has your decision to move to the Philippines, was being part of the Kaya women's team and the coaching staff, has that helped with your decision to be able to really sustain a, a livelihood here in the Philippines? Yes, definitely. Definitely, yeah. Um... I wasn't plan. I had no idea. It was one of those things where after the campaign, I was like, all right, well, let's try it out. I was looking at other jobs outside of coaching. I was looking at a marketing job. And I was like, uh, do I really want to do that? Not really. So I wanted to stay within the community. <laughs> um, right. So it was just really joining Kai Women's and being a part of the, the academy has been amazing, giving me an outlet to stay in the, in the field that I want to be on. Yeah, so it's been great. Can't say bad things. The manager's here. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. It's no, but it's, it's been really good. <laughs> the culture is <laughs> it's open. It's been really good. Go, just go. <laughs> I got you. Just go. <laughs> uh, no, no, it's been really good. And it's... Um, they've given me the flexibility to be able to handle both responsibilities, which is, you know, sometimes can be a bit tough, but um, they're just in full support of like, however I can help with the community. So it's been really, really positive experience for me so far. Definitely. And um, Bella, were there any questions that you'd want to add on? One that we want to ask live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we will respond to them directly. Okay. <laughs> can, can I just add something to what Pat said? Sorry. Um, her getting her coaching gig and, and 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 finding a reason to be able to move back full time to the Philippines. I think that's massive. You know, like um, in the UFL days, that 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 provided a huge shift in the level of quality of the game in the Philippines when a lot of the uh, foreign based talent had a, a reason to come back because the wages were good or or whatever, there was a reason for them to come back and play full-time here in the Philippines. I think that's gigantic, not only for the chemistry of the national team, but also because it shows that there's opportunity in the game, right? Outside of just playing the game, there's opportunity out there. And, you know, for individuals such as Pat, who might have honed their game abroad, they bring a, a level of expertise that perhaps is not already here. And they can bring that over and rubbing off um, if you're a homegrown talent playing against Pat on a regular day basis um, and having to go down her wing, her side of the, uh, of the field on a regular basis, perhaps you will learn new tricks that you would not have developed if you didn't have to face Pat in training every day, right? So um, I think it's great for the, for the progression to have these individuals, talented individuals come back to the Philippines and help uh, homegrown players develop their game. Um, I think it'll, be, it'll bode well for, for the women's game here in the country. And as you were talking about that, I think that another aspect where like what Pat does and such as Ina, in terms of the youth academy of Kaya, you guys have one of the, I guess, better structured youth academy. You have been there for a long time. More than a thousand kids have registered, but it's not just um, boys. You have oh. boys and girls as well. Mm -hmm. And to have an academy wherein you have national team players or you just have the fact that your girls are playing under women coaches as well who can understand them better. And at the same time, it also drags in more people who'd want to join in the academy. I think it's a very, you know, holistic effect holistic. in a sense that you give jobs to the player. You allow them to continue their passion. And at the same time, these girls get to pass on their knowledge to the younger generation, the future women's national team players, because they're playing under the coaches at the highest level. You know, these are players who have played not just in the local scene, but the international scene as well. And it also invites other players to want to join the club because you see that there's so much 
um, as you said, talent, and there's so much insight in the club in the sense that you have players, women players, who are coaching the women's team and for other girls to really join in and to, for more girls to want to play football, knowing that everything is affected. You know, I think that's such a great aspect that Kaya brings that adds to the table of to what it is, as you said, as what it was before to now becoming a family and you're extending your family bigger and bigger, not just for the women's team, but as well as your youth team as well. It's gigantic. Yeah, that was, that was one thing that actually the first, our first meeting with Chris, I told him, I was like, for me, it's really about growing the girls game. Like that's how I want to try to give back to the football community here is that we need to highlight the girls and starting from grassroots is really important. And of course, as you know, he feels strongly about that as well. So um, he kind of really gave, I was really fortunate that he gave me a, a platform where I can help grow the women's game with an established club. And um, hopefully we continue to grow the, the girls side of the club as well. You have youth players from the Kaya Academy. And um, I'm not sure, was it Banzon, one of your players who broke into the uh, to your men's team, right? From, from coming from your academy. So you have that transition of playing for the youth academy, the club team, and then making it to the elite and to the professional scene for Kaya FC men's team. And now it's great to see, because as we were talking about past background, she coaches U13, you have a U17 team as well. And to have girls now as well, that after playing for the youth club, now they have somewhere to go. So your youth players as well, not just for the men's, but for the women's, instead of just playing youth, U13, you know, U15, U17, now they can aspire even higher to continue pursuing football that they can play in the elite team to play with your women's team. So, you know, just that whole, as I said earlier, again, that holistic effect that seeing the bigger picture, it's something not just, which used to be just a dream for a lot of clubs, is now a reality for Kaya FC leading the way moving forward, you know, and it's such inspiring to just to be able to be a part of that, like watching Kaya FC, watching the clubs continuously grow and you guys being one of the first clubs out there to really make it possible moving forward. Shout out to Paul Tolentino, huh? No, <laughs> that was a lot of flattery. I mean, I don't know how to react to that. Right. Um, <laughs> Thank you. First and, foremost, <laughs> first and foremost. First and foremost. No, I mean, it's very humbling to hear all of that. It's, it's touching, to be honest. Um, you know, when most of us got into it, it was just for football. You don't think about it in that. And for you to say it in that light is, is very humbling and flattering. So thank you very, very much. <laughs> Yeah, you're welcome. But <laughs> uh, I guess last, last, I don't want to be the one who had the last say when it comes to Kaya. You guys are in Kaya, so you guys should have that last say. Give us that message. Um, I guess let's start off first with Pat, Jing, and then Andrew. Oh, oh boy, man. I'm not gonna have anything left to say. <laughs> <laughs> let's just start with Pat. Um, anything that you'd want to just leave out there for? you know, for women's football players as well? Um, I just keep saying, like, just keep working and pursuing your passion. Um, I know the journey can be a bit difficult sometimes, but you're going to find your big break. And um, we're slowly trying to create something and hopefully it comes into fruition in the future for the younger generation. Like, for me, that's my biggest passion is to try to give something for the younger generation for them to grow into. So hopefully... Um, we're on the right track and I think Kaya is doing a really good job of um, giving that pathway for um, the youth so that's really important so that's for me <laughs> all right and um Jing will go with you next you know you've really been in football for such a long time from the UFL helping out with UFL to commentating to writing articles again you've been you're all around when it comes to your support for football and how do you want to see that for the women's game I think, um, honestly speaking, that especially with the success of the national team, it's going to highlight the potential of uh, the women's game. And with the, the Women's World Cup being expanded and the, the current trajectory of the team and 
um, sort of the makeup of the side and their belief in one another. And hopefully it stays together and we move into a direction where we get closer to that big stage. Um, I think it will highlight the fact that the club game needs to rise up. And I honestly believe that it could be the next big frontier for Philippine football. I honestly think that there's a space there um, where the quality is good enough, the personalities are big enough, and if you present it the right way, that you could create a real following for, for Philippine football on the women's side, right? One of the biggest sporting uh, segments right now in the country is women's volleyball, right? When you compare the, the quality of their game, of the quality on the court to that of the region, it is not spectacular. I'm not trying to be offensive to anybody who's involved in the game, right? I cover the men's game as well. And it's, it's fast paced and it's explosive. It's not the reason why people watch the game. The people come to watch the game because of their connection to the players and the teams and the communities, right? Our job is to be able to create that connection. That's the whole job is to go out there and inspire individuals in the academy, the way Pat is doing, to go out into the communities and expose them to the game and to show them that the women's game is just as exciting, just as dramatic and filled with individuals with the same amount of passion as the men's game. And hopefully if you're able to present that correctly and well enough into a large enough population, you will have a huge amount of support for the game. And that's what I wanna see, right? Um, individuals that, such as yourself, Tasha and Belay, you guys are crucial in being able to push the game forward because you guys are growing the game and exposing people to the passion that lies not on the pitch also, but behind the pitch. There's a lot of people who are pushing the game forward and it needs that, right? It needs passionate people with good heads on their shoulders who want to see this thing through. And um, hopefully we'll see that in the next, in the next couple of years, right? Um, uh, it starts with good organization um, in terms of running the league. We saw with the UFL when all the limelight was on the UFL, the, there were too many game delays, schedule changes, and things weren't run as professionally as they could have been. Now we're on the opposite end of the spectrum. We're extremely professional and rigid and hard to enter, but the attention is no longer there, right? Hopefully we'll be able to hit um, women's game, uh, the women's game in, in that little sweet spot where the organization is good, the quality is there, and the attention is just at the right time. So. I really believe that the women's game, there's huge potential for it and hopefully we'll see it be realized in the next few years. Jing, I think you should run for BFF. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, am I supposed to talk after that? Like, seriously? Uh, where do I vote? Where do I vote? Nice one, Paul. Good job. Yeah, I, I guess I brought in the right people, right? Yes, he did. Yeah. Um, no, I think the only thing I can really add to that goes back to one of the first conversations I had with a good friend and actually Tosh, one of your teammates in Stallion Hiraya. And they asked me, why do you want to do this? And it was as simple as equality. Like, why shouldn't they be given the same opportunity? Like, why shouldn't um, Kaya have the same opportunity for females that are passionate about football to go after and um, chase that dream that is available for the men. It just wasn't right. And if us doing this as Kaya um, motivates newer clubs or existing clubs in the men's side to then start a women's, I think would be a fantastic end result because it would enrich the women's football scene. Can I football as this group is called um, to bigger and better things moving forward. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jing. And thank you, Pat, of course, for the time that you've shared with us and the knowledge as well that you, you've helped for everyone out there to know more about the women's game and, of course, being important factors, most especially in the growth of the women's football in the Philippines. Uh, Balai, back to you. Okay, so a lot of good things have been said about Kai, about Paul, about the organization, but um, I, I just want to bring back um, something that Paul said earlier is that he did not want to disrupt the game or the league. So, and I picked that, I picked up the, the phrase like disrupt the game 
it's opposite because you guys came in and you guys are disrupting the women's football game by, you know, uh, the way you're portraying it on social media, the way you're handling it, the way um, just everything about it is disrupting the game. And I realized that what we are trying to do here as well and grow her game is disrupt the game because no one is talking about it. No one is saying out loud what we can do, what needs to be done. You know, we have a lot of things to say about the situation, but we aren't putting it in a forum where we can actually do something about it. And so I guess it's a challenge to us to how can we further disrupt the game? How can we um, do bigger things and just kind of come together, as I always say, as the collective with our individual talents and make make something great, like do something great and bigger. So um, I'm grateful that you said that, but we're actually trying to do the opposite. We're trying to disrupt the game. So we like, we change, we shift gears and we're trying to disrupt the game now with Grow Her Game. Um, and hopefully you guys join us again, but thank you for joining us today. Um, with gracing us with your experience, your thoughts, your opinions, and um, everything that you've shared with us. Hopefully, um, people can just, you know, take what they can learn from this and do big, go forth and do bigger things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, thank you guys for joining us with Hashtag Grow Her Game, Filipinas Football Forum at Home Series with the Kaya FC General Manager, Media Officer, and um, Player and Coach. Uh, thank you guys. and. Continue to stay safe and stay at home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having Thanks, us. Guys. Una kaya. <laughs>